At the beginning of 2013, Nika was going through some challenging times. Five of its seven-member team had quit the company, and the startup on average was shipping just 10 orders per day. Adding insult to injury, more than 50 investors had said no to the idea of an online beauty brand. They didn't think that this tiny team would be successful in any way, shape, or form. Less than a decade later though, Nika would celebrate holding India's most successful IPO ever. And at the center of this story is the startup's Nika. It's heroine, a woman by the name of Falguni Nayar. And it's her journey, the story of how she made Nika into a success that we're gonna be talking about in today's video. Coming up right after this. Falguni Nayar started her professional career with Kotak Mahindra Bank in 1993. At the time, Kotak was just an NBFC, a non-banking financial company called Kotak Mahindra Finance. It wasn't anywhere near as big or prominent as it is today, but being from a Gujarati family with its own business, finances came naturally to Falguni. She wasn't intimidated or scared by money. And so at Kotak Mahindra Bank, she played a crucial role in setting up the investment banking branch of the company, which was called Kotak Mahindra Capital. Thanks in part to this initiative, the NBFC began to grow faster than ever, and Falguni quickly became an invaluable piece of its DNA. But in 1994, something happened, a defining moment in her life. Her husband, Sanjay Nayar, who was working for Citibank, was posted to London, and Falguni decided to accompany him. This could have been the end of her career with Kotak Mahindra. But Uday Kotak, the founder and CEO of Kotak Mahindra Finance, had seen how incredibly talented and hardworking Falguni was. She was a huge asset to the company, and he wasn't about to let her go without a fight. He tried to convince her to stay back and let her husband work in London alone, but that wasn't the life that Falguni wanted to live. And so Uday decided that if he couldn't keep Falguni at Kotak Mahindra, then he might just have to send Kotak Mahindra with Falguni. See, he'd been playing around with the idea of expanding overseas, and realized that Falguni was the perfect emissary. After a bit of back and forth, Falguni agreed to set up Kotak Mahindra's office in London, and detailing this experience later in life, Falguni said that I was never a good swimmer, but I was always the first to jump in. The thought, what if I break a leg, doesn't occur to me. This all-in approach worked wonders for the company in London, to the point where Uday later sent her to New York to establish Kotak Mahindra in the United States the same way she had in the United Kingdom. That was in 1997. Falguni, by this point, was Kotak's head of international business, and while she was thriving in this role, Uday Kotak decided that her skills and experience were needed back home. See, it was the beginning of a new century, and private capital markets in India were seeing a lot of action. The country's startup ecosystem was taking its first baby steps, and Falguni was put in charge of Kotak Mahindra's institutional equities business, where she spent a lot of her time taking companies public. In this role, she met people like Rani Skruvala, the founder of UTV, who built a small media and entertainment empire back when the sector was still very nascent in India. The company went public in 2005 with the help of Falguni and was eventually divested to Disney in 2012. Ajay Bijli was another entrepreneur that Falguni interacted with. He built India's first multiplex cinemas, which started off as a single location, Priya Cinema, but eventually evolved into a massive empire with PVR as its flagship brand, a company that Falguni helped to take public again in 2005, and these experiences had a profound impact on her. They brought her back to her childhood, watching her father build the family ball bearing business from scratch in Mumbai. But now here she was, a director in what was now a prominent commercial bank, watching other entrepreneurs chase after their dreams and build empires. And she was an enabler, a facilitator, but she wasn't an active participant. And she wanted to be. She wanted to get in the game. She wanted to start up. And so in 2009, she made herself a promise. By the age of 50, she would become the Naika of her own life. But before she could do that, she needed to come up with a plan. After toying with a couple of different business ideas, including one which would have ended up becoming sort of like an Oyo of nursing homes, she settled on building a multi-brand marketplace for beauty products. See, at the time, India's beauty market was ripe for disruption. According to Falguni, in those days, beauty products mainly meant gudgel and lipstick. That was it. 
For a large majority of India's female population, that's all there was. And a major reason for this was the lack of education around these products. People had never been exposed to a majority of the makeup and cosmetics that Falguni had encountered while window shopping in London and New York. But she had a hunch that if she could somehow introduce these women to this new world of beauty, and if she could educate them on these products and how to use them, then her idea would be successful. And so in April of 2012, Nika was born. The name that Falguni chose for the brand, and we've been hinting at this, came from the Sanskrit word Naika, which means heroine of your life. And that is exactly what Falguni was doing. Her startup was an expression of her own inner sense of adventure. It marked the beginning of her hero's journey. After refusing the call for years, she was finally crossing over the threshold, taking that first step into the unknown. And at first, it was exhilarating. Like a dream, the possibilities seemed endless. But then, well, let's just say that Fulguni was in for a rude awakening. See, you gotta remember here that in 2012, e-commerce was kind of in the same position that cryptocurrency is in today. People didn't trust it. It was almost a bad word because of how many scams and pitfalls there were for consumers to get caught in. And there weren't many regulations in place either. Online payments were clunky and unreliable. Flipkart and Snapdeal weren't even funded at this point. They were just struggling to build trust. And when Falguni told people that she was getting into e-commerce, well, they told her that beauty was not the market to be in. Instead, they recommended electronics or books. But instead of allowing other people's opinions, many of which were unfounded to sway her, Falguni followed her intuition. She stuck to her original plan of educating young women about beauty in the hopes of tapping into latent demand that other people in e-commerce didn't know existed. And like any entrepreneur that's tried to educate the market will tell you, it is an uphill battle. And it didn't help that Falguni had no tech experience. She was a strategist, a visionary, and a leader, but she desperately needed a CTO. In the first three months of the startup, Nika had three consecutive chief technical officers. As soon as one would quit, Falguni would rush out and try to find another. And the hits just kept on coming. Things in the operations department were tense. The company was struggling to fulfill 10 orders per day, and getting them delivered on time was a pipe dream. Angry customers were calling at all hours, demanding an explanation for why their products hadn't showed up yet. Needless to say, things were stressful over at Nika, and the startup's team of seven quickly became a team of two. Falguni and her daughter would stay up until 3 a.m. some nights, packing boxes in between customer support calls. But these nights were important. Falguni and her daughter spent time in the trenches. They suffered. They lost sleep building the company. And so as it slowly grew, and as Falguni got a handle on its operations, she was able to use these challenging experiences to help shape the guiding principles of the startup, the three C's of Nika. Curation, content, and convenience. Curation came in the form of partnerships. Falguni approached as many brands as she could, offering to sell their products in India. And this is how Nika became a one-stop shop for cosmetics. Today, Nika carries more than two lakh products from over 2,500 brands. And these products are always legitimate. They're always in perfect condition because Nika follows an inventory-led model. They store all of their products in their own warehouses. Everything on their website is fulfilled by Nika, which is different from e-commerce platforms like Amazon or Flipkart, which fulfill some of their items, but not all of them, which invariably results in some percentage of products being fake, counterfeit, or in the case of cosmetics, expired. Now, coming to the next C, content, well, this is the education aspect of Nika's business that Falguni had envisioned from day one. Over the years, the company has created countless tutorials, blogs, and pieces of social media content to educate prospective Indian customers on beauty. This content helps them to make informed decisions on what products to buy based on their preferences and skin types. And today, according to one report, Nika actually creates close to 10% of all of the beauty content on YouTube India. So this second C is huge for the company. It's one of their core tenets. And then finally, we've got convenience, the principle that Falguni learned most about during her time in the trenches with her daughter. 
She hated the fact that customers were disappointed, that her startup was inconveniencing people. And so as the company grew, she did everything she could to ensure that Nike's customer experience was top notch. From exploring the platform and choosing items to buy, to checkout, to the delivery process, Falguni wanted the customer journey to be frictionless. And she also wanted to make beauty products available offline too. Sometimes walking into a store and actually trying products out, especially when it comes to makeup and skincare products, is a must. And so Nika established an offline presence. They built the startup as an omni-channel business with an online store, but also more than 70 offline retail locations across the country. So these three C's are what have enabled Nika to grow their revenues by more than 80X in the last six years. And while they were never profitable, at least not up until the financial year of 2021, their burn rate was always significantly lower than a majority of India's other prominent e-commerce startups. And this was important to Falguni. It was something that she learned at Kotak Mahindra Bank, where Uday Kotak stressed the importance of not doing anything which wasn't financially sustainable. And this advice stands in stark contrast to the approach that we see many startups taking. They raise huge amounts of capital from investors, giving away most of their ownership in their own companies in the process, and then they burn through it. They spend years in the red, losing money in the name of growth, and some of them do survive. And of those survivors, a handful even thrive, but Falguni didn't want to gamble. She didn't want to sacrifice equity to grow quickly if she could grow sustainably and safely. And so that's what she did. She was planning the startup's IPO as early as 2017. And as we all know today, looking back, this initial public offering was arguably the most successful in Indian history. And this success is a testament not only to how much of an impact Nike has already had across beauty, personal care, and fashion, but also to how much untapped potential there still is in India to how many people still equate beauty and cosmetics with kajal and lipstick, just as they did a decade ago in 2012 when Falguni took that first step. And it's this potential that makes me think that Nika's IPO didn't mark the end of that journey for Falguni. Her work isn't even close to being over, and Nika going public wasn't a culmination or a conclusion, but rather Falguni's commitment to her customers, the public, and to herself that she would continue to be the Nika the hero of her own life, and that she would also keep helping others to do the same. All right, that is the story of Nika, and more specifically, the story of the incredible woman behind it, Falguni Nayar. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something from it. And if you did, it would mean a lot to us if you could hit the like button, share this video with a friend or two. And also, if you haven't already subscribed, we post new videos every single week about Indian startups, entrepreneurs, and the latest news. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of Backstage with Millionaires, and I will see you in the next one.